All right, we're going to do some demos to see how friction works. Um, I have a spring scale here. Uh, I have a block uh, that has a couple of different materials. So it has wood on this side and felt on this side. Uh, here I just have a chunk of mass that we're going to use uh, when we want to increase the mass or the weight of something. I've got uh, two materials. I've got the smooth slate laptop. Uh, tabletop, and I've also got the uh, uh, tablecloth here that's just made out of cloth. Uh, and what's going to be important uh, for this demo to remember is that we figured out if we are going at a constant velocity, that means according to Newton's first law, all of our forces have to be balanced. And so our net force has to be zero because the acceleration is zero. So if we have a constant velocity, our acceleration is zero, which means that our net force needs to be zero, which means that all of our forces need to balance out. And so if we're drawing a free body diagram for me dragging something across the ground at a constant velocity, um, we know that there's going to be a force of gravity. We know there's going to be a normal force. If there was no friction, I wouldn't actually need to pull it. It would move across the ground at a constant velocity already. We saw that with the, the hover puck, the little hovercraft, where we get rid of friction. But if there is some friction resisting us, then in order to move it at a constant velocity, uh, we need to have our net force be zero. So friction will try to slow it down. And so if it's moving, as long as I pull hard enough to cancel out friction, Okay, just like my normal force needs to cancel out gravity, as long as my applied force perfectly cancels out friction, friction won't be able to slow it down, and it'll move at a constant velocity. All right, so let's take a look at some factors that affect friction. Uh, first, uh, we're going to... So, so what we're going to do, sorry, the reason we care about this is the way I'm going to use the spring scales, I'm going to drag the object uh, across the table at a constant velocity. Uh, and whatever number we get on the scale, however hard I have to apply a force by pulling on it with the scale, that must be a measure of the force of friction as long as I'm pulling at a constant velocity. All right, so first thing we're going to do uh, is see what happens if we change the material uh, that the object is made out of, or at least the part of the object that's in contact is made out of. So I've got this felt surface and I've got this wood surface. Uh, and so I'm going to start with the uh, wood surface down. And attach my spring scale here. I'll put my mass on. Uh, now I'm going to drag this uh, across the tablecloth at a constant velocity and we'll see what force we get. All right, looks like about eight to nine newtons. Um, I want to also highlight, notice that was going pretty slow. If I go at a higher but still constant velocity, look at what we get. We still get that eight to nine newtons. The speed that we are going at, uh, whether you think of it as the speed or the velocity, has no effect on the amount of friction. All right, so uh, let's try the other material. I'm going to flip this over so now instead of the wood side being down, the felt side is down. Let's see what that does. All right, so now instead of 8 to 9 newtons, I need about 17 or 18 newtons to pull this at a constant velocity. So that means the amount of friction has changed, and the only thing that has changed is the material that was in contact. And so something about friction, or something about the way we calculate friction, uh, is going to have to account for what the object, uh, you know, if we change what material the object is made out of. Uh, what, if, what if the... Uh, Object, though, isn't what changes. What if we change the surface it's being dragged across? So I'm going to take this same felt surface and drag it across the smooth tabletop instead of the tablecloth. Uh, and so here we see we're down to like 7 to 8 newtons. So it's not just that I can change, I don't necessarily have to change what the object I'm dragging is made out of. I could also change the surface that it's being dragged across. Uh, and it turns out what actually matters is what the two combinations of materials are. Uh, different materials have different abilities to either uh, uh, stick to each other or grab onto each other um, based on their physical and chemical properties. And so it's the combination of the two things. 
uh, what the surface you're dragging something along is and what the object is. Uh, so in this case, this amount of, surf, uh, amount of friction came from having slate and felt. Uh, it wouldn't matter if the table was covered in felt and we had this slate surface on the block, it would still be the same amount of friction because it's the same two surfaces. All right, so uh, the surface that's in contact definitely is gonna affect how much friction we have. Um, maybe there are other things that affect how much friction there are. Um, one thing uh, that people often think of uh, is that maybe it's the weight that matters. Um, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, the more weight there is, that's just a bigger force of gravity pulling down on this. And the table has to push back up to prevent the object from falling through it. And so it's the table pushing up with that normal force that's actually squishing the two sides of the surfaces together and causing them to sort of bind together and generate that friction. Uh, and so if you can imagine like if, you know, like my hands represent the two materials uh, trying to grab onto each other, the tighter they're being pressed together, the more easily they're going to be able to grab onto each other. Um, but that comes from the normal force of the table uh, and the normal force of the block pushing against each other. I can increase that normal force just by applying an additional force without actually changing the mass or the weight of the object. If I just take my finger and push straight down, I'm not going to push forward, I'm not going to push back, I'm just going to push straight down, we should be able to see that if I push down, the table has to push back up harder. That's going to smash the bottom of the object into the table more and they're going to bind together better and we're going to get more friction. So, without me pushing down, but 8 newtons, if I push down, I can get that up to 18. If I push even harder, I can get it up to 20. I can control how much friction there is just by pushing straight down. I'm not pushing forwards or backwards, just straight down, because me pushing down increases the normal force from the table. Um, likewise, if I lift up, uh, I can cancel. I can, uh, if I'm lifting up, the table doesn't have to push up as hard, and so I can reduce the normal force. I can reduce how hard the table and the object are squished together, and that should reduce the friction. And so again, I'm only going to lift up. I'm not going to um, lift, um, I'm not going to push forwards or backwards while I do this. So without me lifting, about 8 newtons, if I lift up, I can reduce that to 5, even 3 newtons. Um, I can change how much friction there is. And of course, by adding more mass, right, like we can also affect that force. But all this is doing when I increase the amount of mass we have on here, all that's doing is increasing the normal force. It doesn't matter how we do it, whether it's by increasing the mass, which increases the weight, which increases how hard the table has to push back up, or if it's just by me manually applying a force and causing the table uh, and the object to have a bigger normal force between each other. As long as something changes that normal force, uh, that will cause the amount of friction to increase. And when we see our friction equation, we'll see those are the two things that wind up in the equation. Something to account for what the surfaces are made of, how rough or how sticky they are relative to each other, uh, and something that is going to show us um, that is connected to the normal force. Uh, one thing that a lot of people uh, think is going to matter uh, is the surface area. Um, but uh, as, you, as you should know by now, having read the chapter, uh, the friction equation doesn't have anything to do with surface area. Um, but this is sort of a discrepant event for a lot of people. So if I have uh, this wood surface of the block here, and I just put this down, and I drag this across the table now. Uh, so we see that's about 7-ish newtons, 7 to 8 newtons. If I take and flip, so I've still got a wood surface, but I go to this skinnier side. I've got half as much surface area. I'll put the exact same weight back on top of here. So the question is, what's going to happen to the force of friction? Now, there's a couple schools of thought here. Some people think, well, uh, there's only half as much uh, surface area in context. So there's only half as many wood molecules that can only bind with half as many uh, table molecules. So if you think of them as, as sort of like, you know, trying to grab onto each other, if you've only got like half as many fingers, you can only grab on half as hard. Half as many molecules. Uh, some people think this is going to cause the friction to go down. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, some people would make the corresponding argument that although there's only half as many molecules, they're not pressed against each other twice as hard because you've still got the same normal force from the table pushing up, but that force is distributed over a smaller area. So although, yes, we have a smaller number of molecules, they are squished together more tightly. And so just like if, you know, my hands aren't being pressed together very tightly, um, they can't necessarily grab on super easily, but if I squish them together really hard, then there's going to be a lot more friction. Uh, because there's more surface per square inch, uh, that is going to increase the amount of friction. Um, one quick example, what I mean about, uh, I should have done this earlier, I apologize. Uh, a really simple example from your everyday life of how we know that increasing the normal force increases the friction is if you just take your hands and put them really gently against each other and go like this, you don't feel very much. It maybe tickles a little, but if you press your hands together really, really hard and then go like this, you can feel your hands getting hot. That's because of friction. Friction is converting some of your energy into heat. We'll talk about that more in the future, but you're not like increasing the weight of your hands. You're not even increase changing what material your hands are made out of. The only thing you're increasing is how hard they're being pushed together, which in turn affects how hard they're pressing. Your hands are pressing against each other. And we know just increasing that force between them, just increasing that normal force increases the friction. And so the argument goes that since the same amount of force is distributed over a smaller area, it's like your hands being pressed harder together and so we should see the force increase. And so one line of thought says that because we have half as many molecules, it should be half as much force. We should only see maybe like three and a half to four newtons. Uh, the other school of thought goes that, well, they're being pressed together twice as hard, and so it should be double. It should be like 15 to 16 newtons. And of course, the other possibility is that both of those things matter and they cancel each other out, and we're going to get something in that 7 to 8 newton range again. Uh, so let's try. Uh, again, we're going to pull at a constant velocity, sorry. And we can see again, 7 to 8 newtons is what we get. Uh, and so those two factors do indeed turn out. It may seem weird, it may seem paradoxical, but it does not matter how much surface area is in contact. All that matters is what the material is made out of. Uh, this is why bike tires still work. Uh, a bike tire has significantly less surface area than a car tire, but it doesn't matter. As long as it's made out of rubber, it'll still stick to the road. Um, uh, it'll just it'll just wear out quicker because there's less material, um, but it'll still stick to the road just fine because it doesn't matter how much surface area there is. It only matters what the materials are made out of and how hard they're being pressed together. Um, the last uh, demo I want to do is to show the different uh, kinds of friction we might encounter. Um, so you have uh, hopefully read about uh, different kinds of friction. Uh, and we have static and kinetic friction, which, uh, let me grab a bunch of masses here. There are different kinds of friction depending on whether our object is uh, in motion or at rest. So, uh, we're going to start uh, by pulling the object at a constant velocity here. And, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to try to pull it at a constant velocity, but it starts at rest. And so you'll notice when I start pulling on this, we go 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And then all of a sudden I can keep it moving with only 13 to 14 newtons. It took me significantly more force to get it to move in the first place than to keep it moving. That must mean that friction is stronger when something is at rest because I had to overcome 21 newtons of friction in order to get it to move. But there were only 13 to 14 newtons of friction once it was moving. And that's the difference between static and kinetic friction. Uh, and again, if you think about it in terms of your hands, um, if the objects start off at rest, everything can stabilize, whether it is... Uh, some sort of chemical interaction or whether it is just uh, you know rough surfaces physically binding together. When you have time for everything to settle, it's like it's like grabbing onto someone's hand. You can, if you if everything's at rest, you have lots of time to stabilize your bonds. And then if someone tries to pull your arms apart, you can hang on really well. 
But if on the other hand, uh, everything's moving and you're trying to grab onto something that's moving, so if like this arm is going by and I'm going to try to grab it with this one, I'm not going to be able to form as stable of a bond. They're not going to be able to grab onto each other as easily and it's easier for it to slip by. The same thing happens when we're dealing with friction with all objects. Uh, the amount of friction that you have uh, for something that is at rest, um, that can generate more friction than something that's in motion. Uh, the very last thing I want to talk about is that, so that's static friction while it's at rest, kinetic friction while it's in motion. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is that static friction is kind of special. So kinetic friction, the friction for moving objects, is always just trying to stop the object. Uh, and so that is always just going to be as much as it can be because friction is always going to try as hard as it can to stop the object. It's just going to pull as hard as it needs to. Static friction is a little trickier though. It needs to maintain a really careful balance. Static friction, friction wants this object to stay at rest. And so if it pulls or pushes too hard, it's actually going to cause it to move. So if I pull with just two newtons of force, friction needs to be careful to only pull back with two newtons of force. If it pulls back any harder, the object's actually going to start sliding in the opposite direction. If I pull with 8 newtons of force, it needs to pull back with 8 newtons of force. If I quickly switch to 5, there's no way to trick it. There's no way to suddenly, like, you know, I let off and it pulls too hard and the object goes backwards. Static friction needs to constantly adjust to always pull with exactly the right amount of force to make sure something stays at rest. Um, and so when we come up with our equations for static and kinetic friction, they're going to work just ever so slightly differently because static friction has to play this really careful game of making sure that it's always pulling exactly the right amount to keep the object at rest. Kinetic friction, the kind of friction that we see on moving objects, is just trying to get the object to stop. Uh, and so uh, it's just always going to pull with the same amount of force because it's just going to pull as hard as it can to try to stop the object. Uh, and it'll keep on pulling until the object stops.